Dear viewers, welcome you all in the webinar on international cooperation in the field of higher education organized by State University of Bangladesh. Our today's resource persons are Mr. M. Humayun Kabir, President, Bangladesh Enterprise Institute, BEI, and Ex-Ambassador and Secretary, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Government of People's Republic of Bangladesh, Mr. David B. Maynard, Director, British Council, Bangladesh, Dr. Mahbubur Rahman, Vice President, Board of Trustees, State University of Bangladesh, Professor Dr. Muhammad Anwarul Kabir, Pro Vice Chancellor, State University of Bangladesh. And my name is Ummi Nusratulmi, working as a lecturer in the State University of Bangladesh. I'm, to, I'm going to moderate today's webinar. Dear viewers, we will start our discussion with Dr. Mahabubur Rahman. Dr. Mahabubur Rahman, sir, I'm requesting you to kindly introduce the issue with questions. My first question to you, international cooperation among the educational institutes, especially among the universities, has a long tradition. But how it can be more effective and useful for the private universities of developing countries when you are now in a free market economy? What are your proposals? Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Urmi. And, uh... Good evening, everybody. Uh, as, a, as we run the university, uh, we came across these issues long before. And um, in terms of this career development and in terms of our students to reach their goal, uh, in fact, we working from the very beginning of the inception of this university, uh, 2002. And uh, uh, that's why, uh, from the very beginning, we had a cell, which is uh, called International Desk. And uh, we started to write and started the collaboration proposal with the other areas and other universities outside. And one of the uh, person who actually <clears throat> did in time, the, His Excellency, the ambassador, High Commissioner of Bangladesh in Nepal, Mr. Humayun Kubi, sir, he is here. So I think he can recall the attendance of him in Nepal during our this collaboration venture. So uh, it is long before in fact. So we started uh, initially keeping in mind that our students for their enrichment of the career, uh, in fact, uh, entering a good career, so they will go abroad and have some uh the you can say like uh, exposure to the international uh, job markets and some other areas and then we'll come back and finally they will enrich our in bangladesh uh, in terms of these areas so we started this and uh, initially we set up some collaboration with the uk universities one of them is bedfordshire who basically with us for a long standing time but uh, finally we could not achieve that much from the collaboration now my uh, expectation to the discussion today that we basically are very much ready to explore the possibility but before that i would look, like to know from these prominent international personalities like the director of the British Council, His Excellency, the Ex-Excellency, Mr. Humayun Kobe, that from their experience, I mean, how we can proceed. From my side, I would like to humbly request you that uh, to excuse me, because I want to listen more than talk. So please uh, give us your uh, suggestions and ideas uh, so that finally we can go there. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. My next question to you. Do you feel that the universities of the developed countries, especially the universities of Europe, can come forward with more supports in this regard? Over to you, sir. From uh, my, uh, the knowledge which I gathered for the last few years, that uh, a good number of uh, overseas universities trying to set up their own campuses 
in fact uh, ugc also is trying to accommodate them but somehow it could not achieve uh, i mean the ball and the bat they not get together so the thing is that probably the 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 condition which made by the university grants commission is that that if overseas university wants to establish their own campus they will have to go the same way the private university started these are the conditions so i think that uh, i mean uh, didn't work properly now definitely uh, we want this uh, somehow that uh, that higher technology and uh, uh, the faculties staff and the students exchange program these are the thing which can enrich us so i would like to uh, request also our special uh, our guests to say something about this and give us uh, some suggestions thank you sir my last question to you do you have any specific plan on behalf of state university of bangladesh to enhance the international cooperation among sub and other universities of the world over to you sir very recently we actually uh, has given some responsibility to our one of the departments cdc to communicate the uh, universities abroad uh, regarding this uh, this uh, sort of like mou uh, memorandum of understanding you can say or you can say that we can propose uh, some of the areas we can work together in our faculties students and staff so yes definitely we have a plan and uh, we will li would like to go future uh, with this plan uh, in 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 terms of the outcome of this uh, webinar so that we can go forward uh, what were the specialist people are here the after their conversation in fact we would like to say something on this area thank you sir for your kind words now I will move on to our next resource person, Mr. David Maynard, Director, British Council, Bangladesh. Dear audience, you know that the British Council has been working throughout the world in more than 100 countries since 1934 with education-related activities. Based on that experience, may I request Mr. Maynard to please tell us what are the major areas where the universities of Bangladesh may try for enhancing the international cooperation. Over to you, Mr. David Maynard. OK, thank you very much. And good evening to everyone. Uh, very happy to be here. Um, it's, it's a very interesting question. As you say, we work in 110 countries around the world and have, as the UK's agency for educational and cultural exchange, uh, we clearly have a mandate to work in this area. We, we see lots of different um, types of collaboration between universities within the UK and in, in other countries around the world. And I'm very happy to facilitate any kind of links that we can between universities here in Bangladesh and in the UK. I think we need to recognize that there are many different types of collaboration. Uh, uh, Professor Kabir spoke uh, about some international universities setting up campuses. That is clearly one type of, of uh, operation, but that is clearly a very expensive and a very uh, substantial investment uh, for universities to undertake uh, by opening a, a new campus. There is lots of legalities that have to be gone through, and that's one model only. I think we can also recognize that many universities in Bangladesh and around the world already have research partnerships with universities in the UK. And that's often where these collaborations start. So academics in, in Bangladesh and in the UK looking to research in a particular field or a particular area, climate change is a particular area of interest at the moment, obviously very much of interest to, the, to Bangladesh, but also very much of interest to the UK, given that it's hosting the climate change uh, COP26 later this year. Um, research partnerships are one uh, form of collaboration. Exchanges of staff, of faculty, exchanges of students, 
exchanges of programs, academic collaboration, whereby universities in the UK work collaboratively with universities in Bangladesh to look at aligning their programs to recognizing uh, degrees for in, in, in both directions for um, uh, accreditation to be possible, for uh, greater partnerships to sort of prosper. So I think we need to recognize that there are many different levels of collaboration uh, around the world with universities, and these often start quite small and then take some time to build over time, to build that trust, to build that understanding between the two different organizations. And then these can turn into very fruitful and very substantial collaborations in the future. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. David. The educational communities of Bangladesh possess a very high impression about British Council regarding this issue. Could you tell us how British Council can play a more vital role for strengthening international cooperation in the area of higher education? Over to you. Certainly. So, as, as I mentioned before, it, it is part of our remit. We are a UK government agency and we are here to help build collaboration between higher education institutions uh, in the two countries. Um, I think there are many different ways in which, which we can do this. We're also in, in we, we all need to recognize that we're in, in a COVID world at the moment as well. And so educational institutions worldwide have been completely turned on their heads. Uh, operations have ceased in, in all countries. In some countries they've restarted. Clearly in Bangladesh, they are still um, closed, but it has it, this situation has forced universities around the world to look at different modalities in terms of their delivery. And really, online delivery is becoming increasingly uh, a way in which universities operate as a standard form of delivery of their programs, rather than a purely face-to-face -face approach. A blended or a online approach is becoming increasingly. Uh, the norm. We we also see that in the UK at the moment um, there is increasing interest from the universities themselves to engage worldwide. There is a greater thirst, a greater interest to engage not only in terms of recruiting students but also in terms of engaging collaboratively with universities around the world. And we also see that the UK has changed their visa rules to enable students to go to the UK to study programs and then to be able to work for a fixed period of time after they've completed their study. All of these things, I think, show that the UK is increasingly interested in increasing their collaboration with higher education institutions globally. Uh, and clearly, South Asia is an area of great historical interest uh, for the UK. There are long-standing relationships, long-standing un understanding between the countries in South Asia and in the UK. And I think we're in a good position now to build on that understanding, that common trust that we have, to foster greater partnerships between institutions in the UK and in the UK. Thank you so much. My last question to you, what are your overall suggestions for qualityful higher education in Bangladesh with special attention to the private universities of this country? Yes, well, I, I think quality of education is really a huge question mark, in, in particularly in, in institutions in, in the developing world. And, and we work very closely with, with the UGC and the Ministry of Education on um, quality enhancement programs and with other uh, agencies involved in this area. Um, I think there are a couple of factors. Firstly, what we see, and, and this is something that we've discussed with the Minister as well, is that degree programs, educational academic programs, need to have a real life meaning for their students. There needs to be uh, an, an end game, a, a perspective that the programs provide to the students to be able to say, well, I'm undertaking this program so that I will not only be uh, a better person, but I will have good prospects, I will have 
prospects to, to, to travel, to, to find uh, a more fulfilling life, and, of course, to contribute to the society, to feed back into the society as well. And that, of course, is a large feature of what any university should be about as well, is feeding into the society. So relevance of degree programs, relevance of academic programs so that they are real world and not, obviously there is a place for purely highly theoretical programs, but increasingly, and in a country like Bangladesh where there is large levels of unemployment, people want to know that if they come to study at a university, they have a good chance of being able to find employment thereafter. I think the other thing is is making the, the, the program engaging for students. And that means perhaps stepping back from some of the very traditional delivery methods of professor and large numbers of, of students within the, the uh, university and engaging with, with different media. And, and again, I think COVID-19 has forced some of this change within in the university landscape so that using multimedia, using digital solutions, using online, using social media, using a variety of different aspects to deliver programs is more engaging for students. It, it provides a, a range of different um, ways to engage with the program. And, and I think students find that much more interesting and it, it builds their, their, um, their engagement levels. Um, finally, I think trying to make the programs reach and and uh, collaboration within universities within Bangladesh as well. We, we see that there are a, a large number of universities in Bangladesh, a, a growing number of private universities in particular in Bangladesh. Obviously, collaboration between universities within Bangladesh and the UK or Australia, Canada, elsewhere is a good thing. But I think it would also be worth thinking internally are there collaborations between universities within Bangladesh where a cluster could be formed of universities within Bangladesh focusing on a specific theme or academic area? And each university brings with it a certain amount of experience and expertise. And they, by, through a process of collaboration, they all enhance each other's uh, operations. So there are many different ways to look at quality. We could spend all night talking about quality, but those are a couple of ideas that I think are relatively doable and apply to all universities in Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your such amazing words, such valuable information. Thank you so much. You. Now I will move on to our next resource person, Mr. Mohammed Humayun Kabir, sir. Sir, you have served in the Foreign Service for a long time. You have also performed responsibilities in different countries of the world as a professional diplomat in different capacities where education, diplomacy, and cooperation were also included. Based on that experience throughout the globe, do you feel that the level of international cooperation in the field of higher education is quite satisfactory, especially for the developing countries? If not, why? Over to you, sir. Sir, your microphone is muted. Uh, thank you. Thank you very thank much you, for me. Uh, and good evening to everybody. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think I would start by expressing my uh, gratitude to the State University of Bangladesh, particularly uh, my dear friend, Vice Chancellor Shahjan Mina, our new friend, uh, Professor Dr. Anwar Al Kabir, uh, my old friend, Dr. Mahbub, uh, uh, now a new friend, uh, Mr. David Maynard, and also others who are now listening and viewing us uh, online. Uh, uh, good evening to all of you once again. And I think this is a very timely discussion, timely discussion in the sense that we are discussing. Uh, international cooperation and collaboration uh, for higher education. Uh, but for Bangladesh, this is very timely, as I said, and also relevant for two very important, I would say, markers of two important elements. Uh, Mr. Maynard has mentioned about the COVID world. So COVID has 
literally transform the whole world. The way we think, the way we do, the way we interact, everything has been transformed now. So we have to reinvent the whole human uh, civilization. We have, we'll have to reinvent new ways uh, to continue our engagement. Now, Bangladesh is also affected by uh, the kind of webinar today we are talking about, frankly speaking, uh, before COVID, webinar was uh, really something that I used to do with my American friends or European friends. In Bangladesh, it was not a familiar subject. But today, every day, I think dozen webinars are taking place. People are participating. You know, online viewers, many people are uh, watching, viewing, listening. So this is a new flavor of the new world that we are entering. The second important element of Bangladesh, where I think we have to really seriously uh, uh, think about how we can lift our higher education, is the process of transition from LDC to a developing country. That will create a completely new environment for, for all of us as a country, as a nation. Now, how do we adjust or how do we navigate in that kind of post-COVID and pre-transition world? There are, I would say, I would try to bring you a few, I would say, important uh, elements that we can build up. Number one is, uh, we call it global framework for higher education, co collaboration or cooperation. The international community has been thinking about this issue for quite some time. And actually, they have been engaged in this process as well. And that has been acknowledged, recognized in the context of sustainable development goals or SDGs as we call them. Mr. Maynard has just mentioned one issue, climate. That is also, you can say, at the heart of international collaboration these days. Now, how do we do that within the SDG, SDG 4, SDG 16, 17? The, all of them talk about the international collaboration, uh, global citizenship, peace building, conflict resolution, climate management. Now, all these things will require higher level of thinking process. Uh, these days, we call it higher order thinking. So we have to now uh, think about it. And obviously, the higher education system in Bangladesh, either private sector or uh, public sector, all will have to think about this issue. The second important pillar I should put in is now we are talking about the global competence. doesn't matter where we are studying for higher education in Bangladesh, Nepal, India, US. Now, people are talking about global competence, meaning that we have to have a global competence. And if we have those competence or competences, then I think we are, we, we are really up to the standard, if I may put it. If not, then we'll have to reach that goal. And this is applicable for the whole world, not only Bangladesh. Uh, so that is another. And the third one, I should say, uh, Mr. Mehna just mentioned, uh, in terms of the actual collaboration at higher education, we are noticing a couple of trends. Number one is we know that already that is century old. People grow, growing, uh, people going from south to north in the sense from developing countries to developed countries. That trend has been there and that is continuing. And now it has taken a big, I would say, uh, big business also. Uh, if you look at the United States, Canada, Australia, uh, this is not only a kind of you know collaboration, but it's also good business. Americans, America gets almost $40 billion. Uh, Australia gets $15 billion, for example, from the foreign students who are coming to study there. So it's kind of business come collaboration, both are getting together. Now, we are also seeing North-South collaboration as well. Uh, think about some of the top universities, MIT, Harvard, Stanford, 
uh, from the US setting up shops in Qatar, in Abu Dhabi, or they were from Australia, in Malaysia, for example. So we are seeing that uh, the universities, the reputed universities from the north or developed world are now acknowledging the fact that the new generation, the new student body would come from the developing countries. And they are now coming to the developing countries to cater to this market, deliver the products or education products uh, and create a kind of collaboration. We are also seeing South-South collaboration. Look at East uh, Asia uh, within, within Asia, between Japan and ASEAN countries, for example. Uh, you know, so we are seeing that kind of uh, a collaboration taking place within the developing countries themselves. And the last one is, uh, Mr. Maynard has mentioned, and also mentioned that under the Sustainable Development Solution Network, different universities de from developing com developed countries are building up the global network. For example, the Waterloo University in Canada, it has a global sustainable solution network with hundreds of universities from all around the world are participating in that uh, uh, network and trying to address the common challenges of humanity that is touching everybody, climate uh, uh, issue, for example. So we are in terms of the global collaboration at higher education, we are seeing uh, a kind of different trends developing and all of them are contributing in their own way to promote international collaboration. And we have to acknowledge the fact that the kind of challenges that we are facing these days and the new generation would face in the coming days cannot be solved by any particular nation. How rich we are, how developed we are, or how underdeveloped we are. So we have to collaborate, we have to work together. And in, in that process, I mean, higher education comes very much to the picture because higher education has certain advantages. I know we are aware that there is a focus uh, to create grassroots level, uh, you can say, trained manpower. But beyond that, these days, people are also acknowledging, both in the developing countries and developed countries, that higher education is an extra value for particularly, as Mr. Bernard has uh, uh, mentioned, let me also reinforce that. For example, research, innovation, technology, solutions. So how do we, who will invent, who will discover these things? And here I think the higher education collaboration or the value of higher education comes into picture. And now I should, by saying that, I, I uh, got, uh, conclude this segment by saying that collaboration is taking place. Now, how much we are benefiting from that global collaboration is an important element. And perhaps, since we are Bangladesh as a country, we are now making a transition in the post-COVID world, number one, and also making a transition from developing country, a uh, 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 least developed country to a low and developing country. We'll have to seriously think about it. I should thank uh, the State University of Bangladesh for undertaking this initiative to at least talk about, uh, think about, and also stimulate the thought about how and which areas the higher education collaboration should take place and how these universities can participate in that kind of cooperation to really create a kind of human capital that can help Bangladesh to navigate through these difficult challenges that are lying there. Thank you so much, sir. My next question to you. Do you think that the diplomatic missions of Bangladesh in different countries of the world can play a more vital role for strengthening the existing education cooperation practice in the international periphery? How this practice can serve the interests of the teachers and the students of Bangladesh in more efficient and extended manner? Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, very, I would say, good question. Uh, but I think uh, uh, the answer may not be that easy to get. But let me put in my two cents on this. 
yes, diplomacy has an important role. And I can, I must say, uh, the British Council, Mr. Maynard, Maynard is with us here. The uh, US Center for uh, the Getty Institute, uh, the uh, Alliance Forces, they have been there for centuries, decades. And they have been promoting collaboration, promoting economic, or I would say, education diplomacy. Or in our language, we call it public diplomacy. So they have been reaching out to the people of various countries to familiarize them about what is available. Uh, in Britain, for example, for the British Council, what are the opportunities available? How, what are the modalities to follow? How, uh, the, uh, how uh, the higher education or, or students at higher level can, can join the British universities or engage in other programs, for example. So they have recognized that early on. And I appreciate that. Now, it is time for us to also recognize the fact that public diplomacy or engaging or creating a people to people contact and engaging in very different facets of life is an important element in diplomacy as well. For most of the developing countries, diplomacy is still something abstract above our heads. But we have learned from the experience of others, our friends from the developed countries, that diplomacy can be something that can help the individuals and help improve their lives. So I would say that diplomacy has a big role to play and perhaps we need to redirect our attention to this aspect. Dr. Mahabu was mentioned and I, I gratefully uh, uh, recall the time that we spent together in Nepal back in 2003-2004. And I must say that it was a great pleasure to reach out to academic institutions, both in Nepal and in Bangladesh. And I must say that I, the State University of Bangladesh is one of the, I would say, more, most active universities that try to reach out to the regional students. And I, I'm talking about 2003, 2004, uh, with uh, Vice Chancellor at that time, Elias Hami, Dr. Mabu, they came to Nepal and they presented their university for the Nepali students. And I'm, I, as an ambassador, I should say that I thought it was a great tool. It was an important element to reach out to the Nepali, common Nepali students to talk about Bangladesh, talk about how we can work together, talk about the you know achievements of Bangladesh and how we can continue to build up excellent relations. So from that point of view, I think for Bangladesh, this should be an important element. And as I said in my earlier segment, this is not only theoretical. It could be a product that we can sell. As I said, America, US earns almost $40 billion a year from the foreign students. Uh, UK also does the same thing. Uh, Australia, Canada, all these dev developed countries are getting also money. This has now become a service that they are offering. And we are benefiting. They are benefiting. So there is a common benefit, I mean, common frame for mutual benefit. So we can look at that also from that angle. And I am happy to say that what I, I'm, when I see that Nepali students are increasing in Bangladesh, uh, uh, higher education institutions, I feel happy. And uh, I remember when I started my career as a teacher in Dhaka University back in 1976, seven, students of Indonesia used to come to Dhaka, Malaysian students, Iranian students, Iraqi students used to come to them. So we had the tradition. We have that kind of tradition. So we can now build up on that. And that could be done very much as a part of our public diplomacy. Uh, but I must also uh, acknowledge the fact that in our policy making frame, it doesn't play out that way. We still, be, we still 
think it is like any other activity. So somebody wants to come to Bangladesh to study in Bangladesh universities from either Nepal or India. We take it as a normal activity. But in my view, building bridge with human beings, building friendship with others is an, is a, is a, is an important asset. And I can tell you from my experience in both India and Nepal that these people who have studied in Bangladesh, they remain friends of Bangladesh forever. So that is a, I would say, hidden treasure that we have. So with it, if we can cultivate that, it would be the it would be another angle of our diplomacy. These people will go out and tell in the community, Bangladesh is a good country. Bangladesh is a friendly country. So it will not only build up our image reputation in those countries it will also create an opportunity for us to collaborate further in higher education and perhaps from a very material point of view earn more money as others are doing so it is there opportunities are there but we have not yet fully explored this potential my personal view is that this is an area where i think we should focus more and we are doing Bangladesh, we are offering scholarships for some uh, students to study here at higher, uh, uh, you know, uh, at higher educational institutions. Uh, some come on self-financing, but we can we can explore more. I know people are interested to come, and I will conclude this segment by saying that in 2004, I made a survey among thousand Nepalis in four big cities in Nepal. I asked a question, what is your priority countries for higher studies? United States came as number one, and then Bangladesh and India were the tie for second. So for Nepali students, for Indian students, for uh, you know other students, Bangladesh is an attractive place for higher education. But we should we did not be complacent about that. Higher education doesn't mean that coming to a higher education institutions here the quality of education other opportunities should play a role which i think i will talk if you allow me to talk more in the coming second thank you thank you so much sir sir what are your overall suggestions and recommendations for strengthening international cooperation in the field of higher education well, thank you once again. I think another very, uh, uh, I would say, important question for me. I think I would go by what Mr. Mayna has said. Higher education should not only be an academic pursuit. Note my word. It should be more research based. One of the challenges that Bangladesh universities face in terms of their rating, we fail to come up within 500 ranking. What is the problem? The problem, I think, the root of the problem is we cannot come out in good standing because none of our higher universities, our higher educational institutions, universities are investing in research or prioritizing research as an important element. I have heard from all my Chinese friends. I have not tested that, but I have heard that every Chinese student, undergraduate students, ha student has to have a research product to get the graduation degree. Without that, no graduation. And that means that China has prioritized research. Research means what? Something you are moving towards innovating something or finding a new way to lead your life or navigate through that and finding some new body of knowledge. So research I prioritize as number one element. And Ms. Maynard has said, if we can focus on this, international collaboration would be much easier to do. Because this is some one area where my American friends, for example, they come to Bangladesh to do research, ICDDRB. Today we talk about ICDDRB. The ICDDRB, John Hopkins professors came to Bangladesh to study cholera back in the 60s. 
and that region name for ICGRP today. So outsiders are coming here to do this. Can we not do it for ourselves? There are many areas where we can do research. And I go again, uh, I fully agree with my friend Maynard that in addition to seeking international collaboration and support, we can, within Bangladesh, we can create a kind of network. Or we can create a network with our neighboring countries. I recall back in 19, back in 2000, when I was serving in Calcutta, I sent, sent at that time North Bengal University teachers, a group of teachers, to force a kind of collaboration with Rakshai University. And when I proposed to them about this, my friends were saying, at that time I was the TI commissioner in Calcutta, they were saying, well, can you give us what we can achieve? Then I said, both of you are sitting on the bank of River Ganges. And River Ganges has a lot of difficulties on your part and in our part. So you are upper Riparian, and we are lower Riparian. Why don't you study the same stream from two ends? And you find something very interesting. Believe me, that stuck. And they visited Russia University. They talked about it. But eventually, it was not followed up. I'm just giving you as a case study where our neighboring, we can work with our neighboring countries where the real life problems are hurting us. The Ganges, for example. So if we can do that, it will help them, it will help us. And I'm, I'm sure if we propose, nobody will say no. So we have to, again, I'm, I'm going back to my friend Maynard. I liked his, uh, you know, liked his ideas. We, education, we have to focus on solving problems as a tool to solve problems, not as something for a degree. In Bangladesh, I'm now associated with the private think tank. One of the challenges I find, I find a lot of students with higher good higher education degrees. But when I say that, can you give me a solution for this? They're helpless. So it is important, extremely important to really, really instill among these students some qualities to solve their problems, day-to-day -day life problems, our national problems, if possible, why not international problems? So the education, higher education, should focus on the research, life-associated curriculum, and then really uh, uh, um, solving the problems, for example. That would be very, very helpful. And then I should next say that we have to understand that we live in a global world. If I have, if I propose to one of the foreign universities to collaborate, they will definitely look at my potentials. They will try to understand what I do. So, what traction I am creating for myself. The hard reality of life is that we need to give and take. That is the way relationship is built. So, there, in order to build up the global network or be a part of the global network or even regional network. We have to create or add value to ourselves. And I can tell you my, whatever modest exposure I have, I think we have to go a long way. We should think very seriously, not only to pro pro produce enough students with quantity or for, on quantity, but we have to also pay attention to the quality of education that we are actually delivering. And I assure you, if you deliver quality education, People will jump on it because people are looking for quality education. Because, as I said, people want solution oriented young people. So that is where I mean, we may have to uh, uh, focus on. And uh, I would say that uh, we uh, need to also work with the government network. That, let us, I, I know this is something easier said than done. Uh, but I appreciate the state universities initiative early on, back in 2003-2004. They reached out to us. They said that these are the things we can do. Can you help us? And they got support from many people. So if 
we are going to the embassies outside. Why not engage with the ministries here, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Education, for example, and get a partnership. One letter from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Dhaka to an ambassador in any embassy outside would work like a magic to extend support to you. And needless to say, the presence of an ambassador or a senior officer from the embassy will make your job much easier to reach out to a wider audience in, in, in any, any foreign country, for example. So our, I think this is, as we call it, it's like whole of society approach we talk about for other things of life. But I think here also it has some relevance. So why not explore? Why not build up a kind of partnership with the government, ministries, agencies? And we can take as much as we want to take from them. And these days, I would say many young ambassadors, many diplomats, they understand what are the things that they can uh, sell as unique products from Bangladesh. We sell products, garments, every, the whole world knows about Bangladesh. But how many people that we also sell education? good quality education. So why not take it as a service that we can sell to the outside world? It will build up our reputation. It will build up also as a, a kind of export item. And I'm not saying that you commercialize it because commercialization alone will not sell. help. Because as I said, global competence, as we have just mentioned, this is something we have to also have a moral competence. We have to have ethics. We have to have respect for other people. Uh, we have to have, you know, uh, a kind of a mindset to collaborate with others. So with this kind of uh, surrounding, if we can pursue uh, 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 good research activities, uh, build up a good network, uh, can be innovative in our uh, uh, education structure, can find or produce good solutions, for common uh, problems, for example, then perhaps you know, people will look at Bangladesh higher education with a great deal of interest. And we should not be uh, uh, surprised by that. Many of the developing countries these days, as I said, I used to receive Malaysian students uh, in Dhaka universities in droves. My classes had Malaysian, Indonesian students. Today, Bangladeshi students go to Malaysia to study in higher education institutions. Why not we, we look at how Malaysia has developed their edu quality education and drawing students? We can do that. We can learn a few things. So if we are open to, lear, uh, uh, open to learn from others uh, and find uh, to, to chart a new kind of uh, pathway for ourselves, I'm sure that Bangladesh higher education institutions can be a useful partner in building global or building partnership with the global uh, network for higher education. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your valuable suggestions. Dear viewers, we will hear the final comments of the discussions from Professor Dr. Anwarul Kabir, Pro Vice Chancellor of State University of Bangladesh. Sir, my first, first question to you, what are the scholarships fellowships and financial assistance available to pursue higher study home and abroad. Over to you. Thank you, Umminuswa. At the very outset of my speech, let me take privilege to thank Mr. Maynard and Mr. Huang Gobi for their valuable discussion. So Mr. Maynard rightly identified the different areas of collaboration that take place uh, between the international international agencies and Bangladeshi universities. He also rightly identified the role of British Council in promoting higher study and research in different Commonwealth countries. Well, in an informal discussion before the session, I did not forget to mention that I was a beneficiary of British Council as I was awarded Commonwealth scholarship. I got huge assistance from British Council in Bangladesh, as well as in the United Kingdom. So, so what I am talking about, the international collaboration is not a new phenomenon in South Asian countries, including Bangladesh. So I can tell you that even 100 years ago, the scholars from India, Pakistan, 
and Bangladesh, they moved to United States and United Kingdom to pursue higher education, MS, PhD. And you know, in all that cases, the international collaboration was a must. So let me talk about Dr. Muhammad Shahidullah. He was an eminent linguist and he went to University of Sorbonne, France back in 1925 to pursue his PhD. But he obtained PhD on Chorchapot. It was not an issue in case of Europe or United States. And you know, Dr. Kudrati Khuda, he was an eminent scientist of the country. In 19, late 1920s, he went to University of London to obtain ESC. And when he came back, he made a tremendous contribution in the field of scientific and industrial research in Bangladesh. And you know that after independence in 1972, he led the Education Commission. You know, he made a tremendous contribution to suggest some pragmatic suggestions to develop our primary, secondary, and tertiary education. And you know, let me talk about Professor Rajak. He was a national professor. In 1945, he was allotted only 5,000 taka to pass his PhD in the University of London in London School of Economics. And Mr. Harold Lafty, who was once upon a time the chairman of British Labour Party, he was teaching in the London School of Economics. He was his PhD supervisor. And you know, these people, they made tremendous contribution in the field of education, research and industry in South Asia. And Mr. Kea Narayanan, who was once the president of India, he also pursued uh, his higher education in London School of Economics in 1945. He's a friend of Abdul And later he emerged as one of the best diplomats in India. So if we talk about international collaboration between the Western countries and Eastern countries, the Western universities and Eastern universities, this is not a new phenomenon. Now, let me tell you about the important scholarships, fellowships and awards, which are well available to promote higher study and research in the Western countries. So let me talk about about the Scholastic Commission scholarship, which is based in United Kingdom and Australia. And a good number of students from Bangladesh are pursuing PhD and masters in the United Kingdom and Canada under the scholarship. And after returning to home, they are contributing to teaching and research tremendously. You know, very recently, the Chinese scholarship has become very popular. The Ministry of Finance and Commerce of Chinese government, there are other agencies which are offering undergraduate, postgraduate and PhD scholarship to Bangladeshi students. Our neighboring country, India, for long is offering ICCR scholarship. ICCR means Indian Council for Cultural Relations. A good number of Bangladeshi scholars pursued PhD study in Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi University, University of Pune and Aligarh. They came back to Bangladesh and they are now the majority of the scholars in different public and private universities in Bangladesh. Uh, that scholarship is awarded by the German government. I think you may know that Allama Iqbal, one of the noted you know, poets in South Asia, in Pakistan, of course he died when uh, before the partition of India and Pakistan, he went too far to obtain PhD from the University of Heidelberg, a uh, German. And you know, uh, as far as the United States is, is concerned, Fulbright scholarships and fellowships are awarded to Bangladeshi nationals, and many scholars are uh, uh, doing PhD and masters in different you know, different universities of the United States. While visiting the United States in 2013, I found one Bangladeshi national who was from Jaminagar University, he was pursuing his PhD in the University of North Carolina. So this is the areas where this the scholarships and hours which are available in different fields if anybody wants to pursue higher research and study in foreign countries, in the Western countries and in the Eastern countries like Australia and New Zealand. Thank Over you so much, sir. Next question, sir. What are the dark sides of international cooperation in connection with the pursuit of higher study abroad? Over to you, sir. 
Well, before highlighting on the dark sides, let me talk something about the positive positive impacts of international collaboration. Well, you know, because of international collaboration, internationally reported scholars are coming to Bangladesh. They are contributing to the public and private universities of Bangladesh in many areas. Say for curriculum design, many public universities are inviting the foreign experts. They are bringing some new insights in the curriculum of the university. And you know, in my university, in the State University of Bangladesh, we also we also made a made a critical assessment of our departments under the World Bank project, HICAP. You know, this is a very popular term in the field of higher education in Bangladesh. And under HICAP, we made a self-assessment. One of the lapses in the departments as far as academic issues are concerned. So in that way, we are highly benefited by that self-assessment. We understand where the lackings are, and we are trying our utmost to improvise the condition. Oh, and you know, there are also many scholars who contributed a lot to elevate the status, to elevate the quality of quality of our tertiary education. This is because international collaboration helped them to study in the foreign countries, in the developed countries, they are bringing some new insight into Bangladesh universities. But you know, there are some side effects. I would not say drug side, there are some side effects as well. First, let me talk about the case of brain drain. You know, whenever a teacher of Dhaka University, Chitong University, Jaginagar University pursues higher education in United Kingdom, Germany, France, and United States, especially in the Western countries, they promise to come back after completion of the study. But you know, in many cases, they never come back. We are very much familiar to the word climate change. Whenever they, you know, they, they become accustomed to the Western climates, the climate of their mindset also changes. They promise to contribute to their country, but they forget to do that. So this is one of the problems. Drain drain is a very important case in case of Bangladesh. The secondly, sometimes some research topics which are developed in the Western countries might not come of use in the developing nations. Say the students who are studying biological science, pharmacy, microbiology, uh, biochemistry in the United Kingdom, they are actually concentrating on the UK context or United States context. Uh, so when, whenever they come to Bangladesh, they can send them apply those skills and knowledges to Bangladeshi content. Well, I remember back in 2008 when I was meeting with other common scholars, uh, one Nigerian scholar shouted. He said, well, I learned a lot by pursuing my study in London, but I am afraid after returning to my home, I would not be able to apply my knowledge, expertise and skill that I have developed here because the laboratory in my university is not good enough to apply those skills. So these are the real problems. This is the real scenario of the developing nations. And the next one, the next problem I want to tell you that is uh, whenever uh, whenever we uh, apply, we apply the international suggestions in our country, we have got some problem. You know, it is very difficult to work in uh, cross-cultural environment. So the issues which are very relevant in United, United States may not be relevant in, in case of India or Bangladesh. You know, the changes that the American, the British or Western scholars, they want to bring about in Bangladesh, that might be very much suitable in case of third world nations and developing nations. That is another problem. So we have to always realize that we have to, we have to accept the cultural differences between the nations uh, Mr. Humayun Kobir, he talked about the North-South collaboration. He talked about South and South collaboration. I think in order to adopt a uniform environment, South-South collaboration would be much better than the North-South collaboration. Over to Umi. Thank you, sir. Sir, would you please mention what else the faculty members of private universities in Bangladesh can do to avail scholarships and assistance? Well, 
So let me tell tell you that I have started my new journey with private university, with a private university. About three years ago, I joined State University of Bangladesh as provost chancellor. I am also the dean of the School of Business and Social Science. Before that, I spent 22 long years in University of Chittagong as professor in the Department of Accounting. So, so I have some experiences of both public and private universities. So what I have come to assess, the public university teachers are in better place, in better position to pursue higher study and research in abroad because, because of size, because of their experience, they are in better position. Say, let me talk about the Department of Environmental Science of either Shahjal University or Chitong University. You know, they have a huge area to practice, the, to practice what is practiced by the Western countries. They have a state, huge state of, state of the art facilities. And, you know, again, I must recognize that the best graduates actually are attracted by the public universities and the public universities have amphib and PhD program that also attract researchers to pursue higher research in Bangladesh. So that's why I, only a handful number of universities, private public in, private universities have amphib and PhD program. So because of these reasons, the private university teachers, they are finding difficulties in pursuing higher study in Bangladesh and also in abroad. In the public universities, if anyone fails to attract foreign agencies, international agencies to have a scholarship, they have opportunity to do MS and PhD in Bangladesh. But that is seldom possible in case of private university teachers. The other important point I want to mention in the public universities, the young lecturers, they join a group, they create a group, and that group actually uh, concentrates rigorously on studying uh, GRE, GMAT, social, and higher. So that's why in a group study, they can develop their capacity. But you know, in the private universities, only a handful number of faculty members are interested in higher education abroad. So they are, they are staying isolated. So that's why I think they are not put in better places as far as the private university, public university teachers are concerned. But you know, there is a solution. This is not actually a primary problem. The private university teachers, they can also, they can also, you know, uh, apply to the foreign universities. They can sit for GRE and GMAT. And, you know, in in second or third trial, they can they can get a better scope. And that may be good enough to attract the foreign universities for getting admission. So our private universities are emerging, uh, are emerging in a new way, day by day. They are doing better day by day. You know, we, the journey of the private universities in Bangladesh is of only 30 years, three decades. I think in the upcoming day, the private universities also offer research program, and you know, that will also enhance the capacity of private university teachers in, in terms of contribution towards the research. Over to Omen Ustra. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir, for providing such valuable information. Respected resource persons, thank you so much for giving us time from your busy schedule. And viewers, we have reached to the end of our program. If you have any comment or opinion, please send it to cdc at sub.edu.bd. You may also find this Facebook live video at SUB YouTube channel. Thank you for being with us. Take care. God bless. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much.